delay that belief by waiting to make a safety net. Believe that you are capable enough to fix it no matter what happens, because that's what it is, no matter how successful or unsuccessful you are. There are times I have meetings in the morning, I have no idea how I'm going to fix it, but I know I got to fix it by the end of the day. So then you make phone calls and you try things and that's just the game. So why not start the game with what the game is going to require? And, and that's just what I see consistent throughout multiple entrepreneurs, the successful ones, unsuccessful ones, the funds that go high and go low. It was a willingness to take the risk, the fearlessness. And that fearlessness has to be driven from your utter confidence in your discipline or in your vocation or in your abilities. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Super excited for today's guest. Travel Simpson is going to be here on the podcast. It's about to be amazing. So who is Travel? Travel started the Drive Group in 2016 from a tax return. He has since grown it to a multi-million dollar company. His history of working in startup environments of many forms, many different variety of industries helped him develop the skills to identify smart risks, knowing when to step back and when to push forward. After several years working for large organizations such as Davis & Henderson, the Royal Bank of Canada, Genworth, Manulife, and then the Chief Operating Officer for Shell Service Capital, Travel was inspired to start a company that focused on trends and analysis to help businesses achieve consistent cash flow. This is a passion of mine, and I just want to say this episode, Travel has so much value to bring. Beyond his business success, Travel is an acclaimed artist and speaker. His ability to combine his knowledge of entrepreneurship the political and economic landscape and social trends really help shape this interview. Guys, this is a must listen episode. I can't wait to share it with you. All right, Travel, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it, Tiffany. Nice to have a fellow Canadian on the podcast. Spend a lot of time talking cross border. Uh, you know, we serve both sides of the border. How about you guys? Are you mostly focused on those Canadian clients? American clients as well. What's what's your audience? So because of the nature of what we're in, uh, especially during COVID with essentially all of North America looking for alternative uh, investment options, people were looking for consultation. They were looking to understand alternative markets. So we saw ourselves really having a more of a North American presence, right? We're dealing with the same interest rates, essentially the same fallout from political decisions. And because our specialty is in sort of reading the market. So the traditional investor looks at risk. We look at the market as a whole. So we find ourselves uh, going back and across across the border all the time. It's fun fact, my accountant, just as a point of reference, so I always make sure I see the country is based out in Vancouver. So I make the flight out West uh, as often as I can. Amazing. Well, that's uh, we're out on this side, out on this side of the country. It's beautiful. Although we have had over summer, some crazy fires. And I feel like just all over North America, though, between, you know, Hawaii and, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes and the world is a crazy place. So let's dive in. Let's chat a little about, a bit about what you do specifically. You know, you talked about kind of reading the market versus the risk. Yeah. Let's dive in. What does that mean? Tell us more. Yeah, so obviously my name is Travel Simpson. I'm the president and founder of The Drive Group. The Drive Group operates as a trading market think tank and sort of incubator. So we provide consultation on market moves and risk assessments. From there, we spun out our retained capital to doing venture investments. So we like to accelerate businesses or help businesses get their startup capital, as well as real estate development, because we sort of want to understand a bit more of the brick and mortar space. Uh, recently, this past year, we also are trying to put our hands a bit into media. And so we spun out a um, sort of a, a new company called Spoke Podcast Network. And in Spoke, we're looking to sort of have a hub of a vast amount of different informational content. So we want to make the, the real crux behind it is we want to make voter turnout in Canada be uh, a lot better. So we want political content that's uh, sort of easily accessible. Uh, we break down world events in these short sort of 10 minute vignettes. And then just for fun, we have sort of editorialized podcasts where we allow our talent to sort of just be themselves with pop culture events. The concept is you catch them with honey and then you retain them yeah. with that informational content. And we're hoping to be able to go from strength to strength uh, as we get ready to gear up really strongly with that in 2024. So, you know, it's interesting and, and we're going to, we're going to dive into this political content to piece mm -hmm. a bit, because I think that it applies to those who like yourself are taking a stand on something incredibly important, mm -hmm. left wing, right wing, Canada, U S you know, the fact is that people need to show up and, and have an outcome. You know, somebody said something a long time ago to me. Um, you know, I, I remember years and years ago, I was like 10 years old and I rode horses really competitively. And we had like a kid's council of the pony club. And, and one of the things they instilled in us at that time was you can't complain if you don't help. 
And so, because you get people who be like, oh, why didn't we do a pizza party? Or why didn't we do this? And so right from 10 years old, there was this piece that was like, hey, like if you're going to complain about the government, about the pizza party or lack thereof, like are you contributing in the solution? So obviously, you know, a very important topic um, globally is showing up and taking a stand. But from a business owner perspective, that can be a, a scary place to put yourself online, yeah. to be able to go out, put your opinions out there. And so whether that's, you know, and a lot of people who say like, I would you know, never put something political out sure. there online, um, but maybe it's a new business and maybe it's someone that's like, Hey, I don't know what my aunt's going to think, or, you know, what my old boss is going to think, or, you know, as soon as you put yourself out there in any way with something that's not black and white. Mm -hmm in terms of, you know, political views, new business, whatever, mm -hmm. it can be a little frightening. So how, how is that? I mean, that's a big step for you, you know, political content. So walk me through the mindset shift that allows you to do that and feel like it's the right thing for your business. Yeah. Well, for me, my initial vacation is my degree. I went to, I always say the, because I love how in the States they say like, I went to the University of Texas at it, right? So I went to the York University <laughs> uh, in Ontario. I was fortunate to capture a political science degree. My time was spent there. I thought I was going to be a campaign manager. Uh, but at the same time that I was at school, I played football for a couple of years in, in college. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to be a sort of a bilingual risk analyst for Millennium One Solutions. So I was kind of doing both things in the tail end of my, of my college career, graduated and volunteered for a couple campaigns uh, for people who I thought would win. They didn't win. So I was jobless. And at that time I committed to my sort of risk management career, which kind of going from level to level brings me into finance. But I don't think that the, there's something about the love of politics that I discovered in those years in those classrooms that I felt people didn't understand. And as I got older and I'm looking at my contemporaries, you know, just as a point of reference, I have a college graduate teammate of mine. I played football with him, now a football coach. So this is not only a man, but a man leading young men. Okay. I asked, and I've asked him, you know, I'm, I'm in my early thirties. He's also in his early thirties. He has a child. I said, have you ever voted? He said, no. And for me, if we're not capturing the vote of the university educated, college educated, professional career parents of our society, then we're letting mm -hmm. a lot go through the, through the cracks. Now this isn't to criticize him, but then it was about spending time. Why don't you vote? What is it that you don't think? What is it that you do understand? What is it you don't understand? And realizing how esoteric a lot of these things were to the common person who didn't study it, I thought it was a civic duty. Let's enter this space. You know, it's, it's funny, members on my team sit on all sides, right? So as a, as a decision, we try and stay as centrist as possible. We're making commentary. What we're doing is we're, we're trying to present yeah. facts in digestible bites so that you can understand what's going on. And we're doing that both in Canada and the US. So for example, something I'm very proud of is we had a conversation about the debt ceiling. It was a huge issue in the United States of America. Mm. They brought the debt ceiling. If it was a game of Russian roulette, they're on the last bullet uh, in overtime. And the idea that, you know, especially in, in, in how sensitive our society is now, we got razor close to just breaking the world. That's what the debt ceiling is. It's, it's having a credit card bill that's maxed out and you go and say, Hey, can I get a credit limit increase? Or I can't pay for my house, my heating, my, and the, and the, and, and, the, and Congress come back and says, okay, I'll give you a credit limit increase, but you got to give me this. And then you say, well, I'm not going to give you that. And then you guys just play that song and dance right mm -hmm. up to its natural conclusion. And now the bills still have to get paid, but you know, and we're both saying we're essentially both assuming that one of us won't let the other break the economy. And as time has gone on, we've gotten mm -hmm. danger close to that. So we're very happy to release content even about that. So um, the decision, I think, is was more based off of let's not do this for revenue. Let's not even do this to, 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 to outlay our political agenda. But let's do this so that more people just want to get out to the polls the next time they hear an election. Because what's become the case, you know, sometimes you think of single issue elections, you, you know, election about COVID, election about healthcare, election about marijuana. But what we want is we want to change people thinking uh, that they're betting a, a, an issue. You really want to bet your leaders. You want to bet your concerns. You want to bet your futures. Um, and we just want to feel like people have the ammunition to feel comfortable to enter into that space. I think a lot of people get to the point where there's almost an overwhelm. And whether that is a, you know, we on, you know, our agency, we really focus on data and metrics mm -hmm. and making confident decisions. Because I think oftentimes, whether it's, you know, voting or a business decision or whatever, sometimes people are like, I don't know what the right decision is. Mm -hmm. And then their decision is no decision. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when it comes to, you know, of the election in particular, people might say, well, I don't like choice number one and I don't like choice number two. So I'm not making a choice and I'm out. And so 
you know, what would you say to those people? Because I know, you know, in my social circle, I argue this. I'm the one who posts the the picture of the, yeah. you know, the women that fought for the right to vote every yeah. year that says, hey, like, get out there and vote because, yeah. you know, people did big things to make this happen for you. And so, you know, what, what would you say to those people that say, I don't know, I don't know what to do. So I did nothing. You know, to that, I'll, I'll both give a commentary, but I also want to give an answer. I mean, from I come from it from a different perspective. My parents came here as immigrants, uh, which is the result of political policy, right? We, we, you know, my, my lineage starts because my grandma chooses to come here and then sends for right. her children. My father, the same thing. So this was a choice. This wasn't an accident. We wanted this, especially Canada over the U.S. In, in, our, in our circles is a conversation. The, the scary thing is um, not many of them vote. And they chose to come here. The commentary I would say is you have insurance. Whether you see the need for it or not, you do it because you know it's, it's what you need to do in this country. You pay your mortgage if you have a home or your rent because you know if you don't, you know, somebody's going to call you. It's kind of what you got to do in this country. I think of the model in Australia. Now, I, I do think that we can do a better job of it from a, from a legislative level. But in Australia, they have voter turnout close to 100% and it's a national holiday. What I try and encourage people is that the same spirit that gave us universal health care, which I have a personal belief that we're lucky we have it, because if we had to vote on universal health care today, I don't think we'd get it. But the same spirit that gave us that should be the same spirit that causes us all to vote. It is a privilege as a response to where we live. You think of Canada as a country. We don't have uh, neighbors that are violent to the south. There are parts of the world where that's not the case. Uh, we have one of the most accepted passports in the world. There are parts in the world where that is not the case. Uh, we have a GDP per capita above $52,000. We can do better, but there's a lot of places in the world where that is not the case. Um, we have vast amounts of unused landmass, right, that, that we can go explore. There's opportunity here for the brave. Many places in the world, that is not the case. And what drives our ability to achieve and receive and accept all these things it's pressure on our representatives, pressure on our politicians. One statistic, it's been true since I was in middle school. If every person who didn't vote did vote and picked one candidate, the candidate would win by almost 20 points. That's how many people are sitting on the side. Wow. It is it is enough to change the country. Um, now, you know, again, political scientists, I have my own opinions on first past the post, right? As a as a, I, I really believe right. I really believe in election reform. But before I could make that argument, we got to show up. Before I make that argument, right. we have to show up and 100%. that has to mean something. So what I would say is don't see it as a burden. See it as a, as a thankful duty, you know, um, you know, book it off like you book off your birthday. Don't, don't give yourself uh, an excuse. Most times in this country, we have a two month lead time before an election, right? If they, if they snap call an election, mm -hmm. you, you, past couple of times it's been voted no confidence. They snap call it two months ahead of time. You know the date, just book it off. I get it. It's hard to do before or after work. That's the first step. Let's just book it off. Show up. Give yourself a free day, go have a lunch, go with your friends, make a party out of it. You know, I, me and my college teammates, we play fantasy football. Sometimes around election, we'll do fantasy politics. Hey, who do you got? And we'll make, you know, we get yeah. a group chat going and we're laughing and we're taking wagers and yeah. we're betting. And then on the election night, we're getting together, we're having wins. Make it an event because when it's this somber, oh, I have to do it on my lunch hour, the line is long, okay, I'm not going. I don't know that we get the change that we want. I think on an internal level, we have to see it from a different perspective. Well, and I think as business, you know, as business owners mm -hmm. that, that can help influence this, you know, and it's not just, hey, I need to take the day off. It's number one, as a business owner, prioritizing making it happen, yeah. but also making it happen for your team and making sure that people don't, you know, it's it, because some people won't want to ask for the day off, but saying, hey, it's election day, would love it if everyone could participate, whatever you're doing, left, right, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I just want you to go and do your part. And so as business owners, we can do that and we can help encourage that direction and make sure that there is an inclusivity in the availability to go vote. Every year I take my kids, mm -hmm. I want them to know, you know, they go and we, we go and we fill out the slip in the thing and just so they're part of the process mm -hmm. and, and get to know what, you know, usually, um, you know, each of my kids has got to go at least once. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of always been our process. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the same thing, you know, people who are historically busy mm -hmm. and, you know, more success equals more, you know, busier. Mm -hmm. And I, I try not to quantify, you know, somebody, uh, one of my mentors a long time ago said busy is prior to the word busy. He's like, you're busy and my busy, two very different things. Right. This is not a unit of measure, right. like, you know what I mean? And so, but it often, we also see it come up and, you know, if we're, if we're talking politics and diving in, but you also see it when people get uh, elected for jury duty. Mm -hmm. People say, I'm too busy, yep. and they do everything they can to get out of it. Mm -hmm. 
And my concern with something like that is all of the people who are then making the decision are maybe the people who aren't so busy. And I, you know, podcast, but I'm using those, the finger quotes, not so busy, but we want a good variety of people voting, whether that is in an election, whether that's in a court case, whether that's, it's, we have to have a good sample yep. because those are those super successful people are the first people to complain about policy and the effect on business and the wrong person in. And, but they're, they're not always the people that always show up yep. to make that vote or do that jury duty because, Hey, they're busy. Yep. And so, and I, I get it. I'm, I, we all, we all got lots going on, but I think it's time that we all collectively work together to make it happen. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've partnered with other companies before. On election day, we make it a mandate. Your only job for the day is to go vote. Wow. It's, it's technically that's your task for the day. Everybody's working from home, go vote. Um, but I mean, I think there's that sense. There's obviously there's an interesting trends in society. We, we mark them internally as a business. It's part of our, our consulting work. We have to understand sort of urban planning economics. So people shifts and different sort of demographics yeah. are, are operating in different ways. And an interesting way you're seeing it is even in the in the types of people that are having children these days that the you know well educated working class individual as time goes on aren't having as many kids uh because they say they don't have mm-hmm. time because you know I and mean, then usually the people who have a lot of free time <laughs> are having all the kids and that i think bolds an interesting question for what society is going to be tomorrow because at the end of the day we're getting an overpopulation of people that are going to have values that that came from you know the product of their of their environments right so i think um you know i would say you're never going to have utopia but i think in in these instances community thinking helps um, there's so much echo chamber mm-hmm. thinking that happens even in business, but you know, I think, you know, business, you can go fast alone, but you go far together. Collaboration is something that I think you and I understand deeply. There'll be times I'll be beating my head against the wall, trying to do something, trying to do something. I could meet one person, hurdle it, jump twice, go around the corner back because they just had that, that unlock. They didn't even know what it would do for me. So I think as business owners, we have a different sense of collaboration because we have all these real world pieces of evidence of how it's worked. But I also think that what people don't understand is we also have the real world understanding of the risk. I've partnered with people before and it was a terrible idea, right? And I had to live with that as well. And I think that, you know, if we're if there's any role that we can play is to say it's okay to take a risk and pay the price because big enough risks, you only have to get right one time for it to be worth it. Uh, I think, you know, yes. Abraham Lincoln's statistic in elections, I think he's like 20%. I mean, he was losing a lot, 80% losing streak. But he's known because he's this guy and he did this thing and it's incredible. The same thing works with venture capitalists. Some a lot of some of your favorite venture capitalists have terrible win rates. You know, they only got it right one time. But if you get it right one time, you can you can kind of eat off that and live off that for, for many, many years. Um another one is uh it's one of my favorite movies, Eduardo Stavrin, the co-founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, gets a settlement, hundreds of millions of dollars, spins out a venture capital company, no winners. No winners. It's been almost 20 years. Not a single winner. But guess what? He's Eduardo Seven, co-founder of Facebook. And that's okay. Yeah, I think that when you, you know, it's it's the, if you go back to, you know, being young, I remember my, you know, I was like 17 years old and I used to <laughs> teach riding lessons and I used to make $25 to teach a riding lesson okay. at that time. And I would go and I would take that $25 and I would go to the gas station and I had a little Chevy Cavalier. Mm-hmm. And I went to that $25 would buy a full tank of gas. And I, at that time in my life, I say those were like the $25 problem mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. days. And then one day it was like $100 problems. And then it like has, you know, and then as you grow and, and, in and, uh, you know, businesses grow and whatnot, and suddenly, you know, you're, you're making million dollar decisions or hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollar decisions and it's such a shift. And so, but if you, if you're at the wrong time or you're looking at the wrong problems, you know, a person who's dealing with hundred dollar mm-hmm. problems suddenly has a hundred thousand dollar problem. And they, this is, they, there's, they don't have the skills to even work through what makes sense. But when you've got, you know, whether it's someone who's doing these big deals in venture capital, there's, there's, there may be lots of losses, but they've also had lots of wins to cover some, you know, there's, it, it balances out in a way and the overall might not be great. But to that same person, maybe losing a million dollars is the same as somebody else losing a hundred dollars. Really, just depends on where you're at, right? Yeah, it's it's such a different. Yeah, it's it, it's all it's, it's all mentality perspective. I think I, I have a very good memory, so I like to remember the days when I had twenty dollars problems. You know. Yeah. Because you kind of realize that problem solving is the same. You know the way you handle it. Take a deep breath. Think of your options. Do all of those things. There are applicable skills at every at every level. Um, but the truth is that if you hit a moment of true momentum, there's nothing that really prepares mm-hmm. you for it. So you, so you have to rely on your previous skills. 
So yes, it's a different right. concept, but the core value of how you handle the $10 problem is how you will handle the million dollar problem in terms of its core concept. Yes. And of course. the success of any business or any individual, I, I always look at this with athletes. Athletes are called the greatest of all time, but will win like five championships. Six, you know, Michael Jordan played in the NBA 15 years, won six championships. He's the people call him the best of all time. LeBron James has been in the league for 20 years. I think he has, what's it, two with Miami, one with Cleveland, one with LA. That's only four championships, 20 years, 16 years he didn't win. He's Mount Rushmore of basketball because sometimes it's just about a run. It's just a run of form that if you, if you ride the momentum right. properly, it's not about, you know, it's just about handling it. With, with, with grace and dignity and the same way you handle the $10 problems and you'll be able to go from strength to strength. That's what business is like. You know, people, business is like mm -hmm. children. There's never a good time. You're never going to be ready. You kind of just got to get in the arena and, you, you know, you start throwing punches and see what happens. Right. Are you familiar with Tim Grover, the author? Huh? He, he talks a lot about uh, Michael Jordan and lots of different, and I didn't grow up, you know, I, uh, zero basketball in my <laughs> life at all um, and have, um, so didn't know much, you know, it's like, I mean, you know who Michael Jordan is, of course, but like, didn't, it wasn't, I didn't know much about mm -hmm. it. And I, I got hooked on uh, one of his books during COVID and have since read another one. And I absolutely love him. If never, if, you know, if any of our listeners have not, um, great audiobook. you know, there, there's, there's, there's books and then there's like good audiobooks that are like so well done. His is the, the audio actually, I think elevates the book instead of takes away some of them. It doesn't. Um, it's, he does an incredible mm -hmm. job. Um, and I'll link both in the show notes that I've read because they are two of, I think my favorite, I mean, I do a lot of, um, I said a lot of reading. I don't do a lot of reading anymore. I used to do a lot of reading. Now I do a lot of audiobooks. It's not the same thing, but his two would be two that I recommend to almost anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, and even, um, have shared parts of some of them with uh, my kids who are, um, you know, aspiring athletes and whatnot, and some great mindset pieces there for life. Um, you know, health, business, just, just incredible. I'm a huge, huge fan of his for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the venture, venture capital part of your business, the, the risk and, and the market and whatnot. And let's, you know, obviously the, the, the politics is, is such a big piece for you now, but you've got this other aspect that has been such a key part of your business and life journey. So let's dive in a little bit on that. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the crescendoing of our entire venture business, this past year, we did a competition called Drive 250, where we gave away $250,000 to a winning entrepreneurship idea. It essentially was like a pseudo Shark Tank, Dragon's Den type thing. So we do, we did competitions on Instagram and the way people would make it to the next week, yeah. borrowing from American Idol is views and likes. So if you got the most views and likes, we accumulated that score, you move to the next week. And then you got little challenges that would have to be your sort of video vignette. So as people follow on Instagram, they, they had a rooting interest. And then we shot this sort of final show that we put on YouTube. Now, the first season is really just a show to quality, but it houses the spirit of what I like about venture, uh, venture investment. I remember once somebody said, the world is not short of people with money, but it is short of people with good ideas. How do you get people with good ideas out of hiding? You got to offer them money. <laughs> 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 so it's this interesting thing where I, I am so inspired by entrepreneurs. Um, I think of a, a cheap plug, Happily AI, who was the winner of our competition. And what they do is they, they essentially amalgamate different funding sources and allow you a single click option to, to apply. And that's huge for me. I used to work at a tech company and I, I remember spending a month on a shred claim once. And with these guys, it's a single click and you, you can kind of go from strength to strength. And so simple. So I would have never come up with that idea, but I would love to invest in that idea. And it's so interesting because the owner of the business, he says to me, we might not find the cure for cancer. We might not help people with rent. We might not do this, but he goes, we might fund the company that does so. And I think that's how we feel about our venture business. We want to, we want to be in the room and have the conversations of people tackling and challenging some of the largest issues in our space. So for that reason, we we like a focus on Canadian entrepreneurship because I think that's an underserved market. We like a focus on BIPOC mm -hmm. and women investment because I also think that's an underserved market. And there's a huge push happening in the States that we don't quite have yet, which is a direction to fund female entrepreneurs. It's a multi-billion dollar business. There's literally billions of dollars waiting on the, on the table for 
uh, female-led entrepreneurs. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Most people know women drive the market, right? They do all the shopping. You see that. We live in a state in time now where CEOs, entrepreneurs, have to sort of sell their image along with their business. You, you know, gone are the days of the infomercial saying, "Not only am I uh, the the president, I'm also its first client." You know, with the with the with the cheap infomercial. You want people that feel like they're having a yeah. lived experience when they use your product. So to us, it's a no-brainer. Yes. We, we want to um, have that as a target. Now, it's near and dear to my heart because I worked as the head of operations for a female CEO um, for five years. And I, I saw what it was like when we would go get um, funding opportunities and how the doors would, would shrink a little, uh, depending on, on how they look at the org chart. So we don't, I think, want to be part of that. So we want to kind of lead the charge, which is why for our Drive 250 competition, we wanted it to be a show because we want this to be something that goes on record. So, yeah, we're we're a mid tier uh, venture. Um, we try and keep the checks that we cut down to, uh, you know, three million dollars, five million dollars is probably the max that we're going to do. Um, ownership percentage obviously varies based off the business, but what we like to do is we like to sort of social medialize or YouTubeize every investment. We want there to be a record, so that five years from now, six years from now, seven years from now, more than just a record that hey, we were with these businesses and it's great but we would have a roadmap on how the other venture companies will follow suit. So we're trying to add good principles to venture investment only because in this country, venture capital is usually very esoteric. It's companies you've never heard of. You don't know who's behind them. You go to their websites. There's nobody to contact. You can't even email them. It's all this closed door type system. And I think our hope is yeah. to change that. What an incredible mission. And and I think, you know, it's I've been in enough of those meetings, um, both in a, C, a woman CEO mm -hmm. role, but also, you know, I was a VP of finance and tech, um, part of a very successful business partnership uh, that had that very charismatic, um, you know, male CEO leader. Mm -hmm. And I will say, you know, number one, I learned so much from, you know, watching and being a part of those meetings. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, there's so much value sometimes from even just being able to be in the room and learn mm -hmm. how these conversations go and whatnot. There's a lot of study, you know, there's a lot of statistics that go into, you know, men will be more willing to ask for things. Women will feel mm -hmm. uh, less qualified. I was actually um, on a call just last night, um, working on a potential, you know, great position for someone. Thought they've been working with us for a while, but we're going to make that a little more official. And she said on the call, she said, um, I don't know how I earned this opportunity. I'm having such, um, you know, of this like feeling of just like, I don't belong. Like she, and straight out on the call. And I, I was like, no, you don't. You have already earned this spot. You already been doing this. And so, so interesting. And I think it really plays into, um, you know, people being willing to go and ask and take those steps and believe in their vision and whatnot. And so actually sharing some of those conversations and processes, I, I think helps people build confidence, see other people doing it, um, you know, and, and so kind of taking it out of the shadows and bringing it a little more forefront really helps change the future in a, in a really serious way. Yeah, I think, you know, part of the reason I became an entrepreneur, uh, when I think back about my childhood, living in this country, there's not many head offices here, right? Was, when I was growing up, there wasn't, you know, Google head office, no Facebook head office, no you know, Microsoft head office at the time. So the idea of, you know, the, the life that I dreamt of and what I wanted, I couldn't get doing the go to school, get a good job, work your way up the ladder. I had to, I had to make the business that would, that would pay me what I thought I wanted. Um, right. And, and I think that's true of a lot of people. You know, this is being specifically here in Canada is, uh, sure. Okay. One tenth the size of America. Fine. Um, but such a huge landmass, such vast difference of people. When I think of that, I really do think of a land of, of opportunity and dreamers because there's nothing but empty space. You know, if you go to New York, yes, you're motivated, but you also feel the weight of, I can't fill any more space here. It's full. <laughs> it's, it's, they're done. It's New York. Right. I go to so many yeah. different country, uh, so many different cities in this country and I see opportunity. Oh man, I wonder what could go there. When, what could be built there? I, I wonder who's going to fill that space. Man, do you guys, do you guys have this studio here? No, you don't. And it just, I think that what we want to do is, you know, doing shows like this, uh, publicizing our venture, is we want to normalize people saying, no, you know what, I'm going to give it a try on my own, if only here. One thing that, that was so revolutionary for me is I do this thing. So because I played football, I have all these athletic habits that I don't know how to uh, get rid of in business. So one thing I used to do in football is you watch, right. you watch a lot of film. So, you know, you watch your opponents or, you know, you watch yourself at yeah. practice to kind of see. So one thing I do is I, I read and listen to business profiles all the time. I'm always 
like deeply into stories of other entrepreneurs. And I'm not just talking about the successful ones. I'm talking about the failures. Like I did, uh, I looked into Elizabeth Holmes, who, who was Theranos, out because I'm trying to figure out what happened. You know, where did that happen? Like why? Because you want to see the similarities, the differences. One thing that stuck out to me, Bill yes. Gates, they're talking to him and they say, hey, Bill, you know, why did you leave Harvard to, to make Microsoft? Like, you know, what did you decide to do that for? I thought he was going to say, like, you know, I believed in computers. It was the future. Something very clairvoyant, Bill, very Bill Gatesy. Right. Bill said, um, right. because if I failed, I knew my dad could get me back into Harvard. I, I sat with that <laughs> for, for a month. And I'm like, wow, like, Bill Gates is highly intelligent, yes. Highly capable, yes. But at the end of the day, Bill was just fearless when it came to taking a risk because he thought he had cover. Now, could his dad have gotten him back in? Look, Bill came for money. He, he, I'm sure it would have worked. It would have, there would have been some pain, maybe some embarrassment, but he's going back to Harvard. And then the battle really became, yeah. if the secret is fearlessness, how do we, as entrepreneurs, just have that? You Just, just have the fearlessness. Because you're not going to make mm-hmm. Microsoft unless you leave Harvard. So whether you think it's that your dad can get you in, or whether it's that you're fearless enough to, to think you'll figure it out, you got to leave Harvard. And I think that's what we want to start yeah. to sell as a concept that you know, safety nets are fantastic. I don't, I don't not believe in them. But I'll say this, if you're an entrepreneur, you, you have an ego that believes that you have an idea good enough that people should compensate you for it. That's what, that's what it is, right? If you have that right. much belief, then believe enough in yourself to think if you miss, you'll figure it out before you hit the ground. That's what I always say. If you have enough confidence to think, yes. you know what, I'm going to go out on my own. I can do it better than everybody I've seen do it. Then don't delay that belief by waiting to make a safety net. Believe that you are capable enough to fix it no matter what happens. Because that's what it is, no matter how successful or unsuccessful you are. There are times I have meetings in the morning. I have no idea how I'm going to fix it, but I don't got to fix it by the end of the day. So then you make phone calls and you try things. and right. That's just the game. So why not start the game with what the game is going to require? And and that's just what I see consistent Absolutely. throughout multiple entrepreneurs, the successful ones, the unsuccessful ones, the funds that go high and go low. It was a willingness to take the risk, the fearlessness. And that fearlessness has to be driven from your utter confidence in your discipline or in your vocation or in your abilities. Um, you got to believe Absolutely. your own hype, you know, you got to believe your own hype or else. It's interesting. You know, I, so I'm, I'm fairly, I would say risk adverse and my <laughs> decision, I, I had a, a I'm not going to say a cushy corporate job. I was a partner and I worked at the time, I felt like I worked my ass off, but we also had many a business lunch and <laughs> and whatnot. It was a very different, different vibe. I mean, I worked super long days away from my young kids. Uh, we were, you know, one of the fastest growing companies in Western Canada. And it was, it was all, it was great. Mm-hmm. But you get to the point where you're like, Hey, I'm spending a lot of time around a boardroom table mm-hmm. talking to people about, you know, I was like, I want to do something different. And I yeah. made the decision to leave and start my own business, that entrepreneurship mm-hmm. piece. Now, as someone who's pretty risk adverse, I go from, you know, I had the super nice company car and the company phone and, mm-hmm. lo- you know, lots of zeros on the paycheck, mm-hmm. big mortgage, life yep. built around all the money. Yep. And it's like, hey, we're going to do this. And my husband thought I was crazy for sure. Absolutely thought I was crazy. And I was and and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I knew I was just wrapping up my MBA, uh, which was going to not be super useful as an entrepreneur. I mean, I'm great. At, I'm glad I have it. I love school. I'm glad I did it. But ultimately, it makes zero difference to my entrepreneurship journey, right. whether yeah. I finished my MBA or not. Would have been worth more in the corporate world, add a little extra money or whatever. But, you know, that's not why I did it. Um, so, but, and I, I had no idea, but I was like, you know what? I've been doing this for like 12 plus years. Mm-hmm. I've got all this education. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm selling, but I, we're going to make it work. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, two and a half years later, things are, you know, we've got a huge client base all over North America. Things are doing really well, but that decision, mm-hmm. that, that decision to leave that safety net, mm-hmm. I mean, that was probably the biggest decision of my life. Mm-hmm. And it's the one that you had to make, you know? Um... Yes. It's so funny. It always feels like the cushy job is what gets us all. I was working at a beautiful space. I'm, I'm, I'm bilingual. I'm fluent in French. I was a regional auditor. I was going to Montreal one, once a month. They had an apartment for me, a, a card. And I had this job and I was 20, 23, 23, 24. Man, 23, 24, newly graduated from the York University, making more money than I thought I knew what to do. I, I could not believe it. And I just had this desire to yeah. learn how to manage my own money. And, and I had this job that I had this extra capital. I remember when I went and told my parents. So my mother's an entrepreneur, which is funny. Or, or it's funny because of yeah. what she says. My mother's an entrepreneur. My father, I think, always wanted to be. But, you know, man, God love him, really felt the, not the pressure, but the responsibility of being a father and a husband. 
I just never wanted to risk it. I just right. felt, you know, if my wife is taking a chance, yeah. I got to be the one with a consistent paycheck. I'm not going to do it. Um, and, right. and then there was a period of time where he was going to try. And my, I have a little sister. We're 10 years apart. So, you know, he has me. He goes these years, about nine and a half years in, and he thinks, you know what? I'm going to give it a go now. We're established. Spent like two months trying to be an entrepreneur, and then my mom was pregnant again. <laughs> so, so that was it. <laughs> that was it for him. But when I yeah. told him I wanted to quit, you know, you know, my father's more like, kind of like, hey, man, if you want to, then sure. My mom had more, like, it was like, it was like talking into my soul, kind of grabbed me. I'm, I'm pretty tall. Yeah. And she says, it's going to hurt more than it's going to make you happy, but the happy will cover the times that it hurts. I'm like, what do you mean? It's going to hurt more than it'll make you happy but the days that are happy will cover when it hurt if you can handle that then i wish you success and i think that sometimes when people see entrepreneurs or businesses they think 365 days in a year 300 of them are fantastic you probably have 65 rough days the truth is <laughs> 300 days are pretty damn stressful 65 where you're like wow look you know look at what's happened here but you gotta love it you gotta love the game and the and the joy so i was so happy to get that advice that you know you th I always used to say, oh, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't quit my job to work for somebody, but I traded in my one manager for my client list of 5,000. I work for 5,000 people now, <laughs> you know, like, um, or how you service your staff is different. I used to think, you know, as a man, I, it was so interesting because I was a manager. I was in these leadership roles, supervisor roles. There's a way that you supervise because you can always say, oh, the message came from up top. Sorry, guys, this sent me there. Versus the way uh -huh. you have to lead because they know this is your idea and you have to sell it a totally The buck stops way. with you. <laughs> they know. Yes. You can't. Yeah. Within the, those first couple of months, I realized, I'm like, man, because I, I always thought, I'm like, I'm great at leading people. This is fantastic. But what I was great at doing is I was great at kind of deflecting. So I'll take the message from ownership <laughs> and I'd be able to congeal mm -hmm. and politicize my team and get them just enough to think I'm on their side with every part of it that was great. Get them to think it wasn't my idea, the parts that they didn't like, so they don't turn on me. And now I motivate and, they, and then I go to my managers and the numbers are great. And it was fantastic. When I hit ownership. Yeah. And I realized that first, I never forgot it. The first staff meeting and there was pushback. And I realized that I can't use any of my tactics because it, it's nobody else's <laughs> idea. Right no. Nope. And there's no answer. That's, yeah. I can't say what a client wanted or because it was I, you know, and, and learning that <laughs> was yes. such a weird, unique thing, which is why as a, as a, what I learned from that is as a staff, we don't do meetings. So I say meetings are only to build culture, information we, we do digitally. So I'll text you, I'll call you, uh, I'll email you. But if we all come together, it's so we build community. We got to feel in one step because we have to survive those moments when I know you don't agree with me, but you got to know I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're still tribe, we're community, yeah. but there's gonna be a lot of days you're not going to agree with me. And that was weird too, because coming from traditional corporate Canada, we had meetings for everything. I mean, we'd have meetings about how to open the door and everything. everything and they're all 30 minutes <laughs> to an hour for, for no reason. Oh, at least. For no reason. Hey, at least. You always start the same way. Hey, guys, there's going to be a quick touch point. When I heard quick touch point, I know, close the I'm going to be here for at least an hour. This is a quick touch point. Why is there 400 of us in here? You know, it's just not, it's not fair. But uh, yeah, I never forgot that, that leading as a supervisor versus leading as an owner is dramatically different. And I don't know if I was ready for how different that was. It is. It is very different. Um, you know, the buck stops with you. I love the moving away from meetings. It's something for me, you know, meetings. Uh, so much wasted time in a lot of businesses sitting around, uh, you know, listening to people talk about things that have you really, it's like, send it in an email, a quick update, but like, I don't need to know your nitty gritty. It has nothing to do with me and what I'm doing over here. Mm -hmm. And so I think for things on like, you know, really talking about culture, talking about like values, like this is where we're going mm -hmm. and like kind of those like, you know, annual, like let's dive into what the objectives mm -hmm. are this year and let's, you know, break bread and and discuss and and get everybody on the same page love things mm -hmm. like that um mm -hmm. but so much i think that there is so much still to, to come uh in terms of optimizing those processes and really just giving that time back to people who use it for mm -hmm. uh good they're mm -hmm. you know it's like they're you you're, you're wasting time that could be driving to the needle so you know so many so many valuable pieces here travel when you know, what is one thing that someone could implement in their business right away? You know, what is that advice that you have for someone that can help them see that that win? So I thought about this because uh, I've been chewing on this one because I, I love that you, you want something that in the immediacy. 
So I'll say two because I, I don't necessarily know the audience. So I'll say this. If you're a person who exists kind of in the moment, you have a general vision for your business, use this week to vision cast it. Get a piece of bristle board, cut, cut out pictures, write it down. Have it as a physical image, a physical representation, something you can see and meditate on. You'd be dramatically surprised how that will change your focus. It, 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 it you know, on the rough days, on the good days, just having that image, not this sort of subconscious, subtextual thing, but but a, a, a raw piece of of, of of an artistic element you worked on, I think is is, is great for focus. That's the first thing. Uh, I'll give three. Second thing, we touched on it. Uh, cancel all your meetings this week that are for informational content. Uh, only keep the ones that are for culture, but cancel all the information meetings. Uh, and uh, like nobody cares the, the annual report stuff. Cancel all that stuff. Send it an email. Or send like voice notes, right? <laughs> yeah. you have what, send voice notes. You know, verbal does work. Cancel all that. You'd be very surprised how much more productive people are going to be. You're gonna you're gonna see people with an extra hour, hour and a half, two hours at the end of their day just because uh, we we didn't have meetings. Um, and I and that'll allow you to, to have a more productive week. My personal opinion. I think one week is a good sample size for that. Uh, and the third thing um, that that I always think is is you know a, a doomsday strategy. Um, a good leader has to replace them, replace their tasks uh, consistently. This is my belief that if there's something, and I, I try and do it in an interval of about a year and a half to two years. So if there's something that I had to do two years ago, if I still have to do it today, uh, something's wrong. So if I have a list of 10 things, the goal is that of my 10 things, two of them have to be off my list because I gave it to somebody. And, but that what that allowed me to do is add another two. So the business is growing. I would encourage uh, any yes. entrepreneur this week to think about uh, the things that are currently on your to-do list, okay, that you want to get rid of in two years and who you want to give it to. You'll be surprised how much it'll help you mentor that employee or that partner in a different way. You'll see them in a different light because you'll understand how integral they are to the business and they will also then understand how integral they are to you. So those are the three that I'll give for the week. Absolutely incredible value there. Absolutely. Okay. Where can people connect, see this content that you talked about? You talked about YouTube. Yep. We've got some short form video out there. Yep. Where, where can people see and connect with you? So obviously the hub is thedrivegroup.ca. That's T-H-E, drive, D-R-I-V-E, group, G-R-U-P, dot C-A. That's the easiest hub to find everything. On Instagram, we're at the Drive Group Inc. So the Drive Group and then I-N-C. Um, and to find me, my Instagram handle is Triv Simpson, T-R-I-V-S-I-M-P-S-O-N on Instagram. Uh, and uh, if you use any one of those three things, we'll direct you to the other stuff. Uh, we're going to have handles going for days, but definitely drivegroup.ca, <laughs> at the Drive Group Inc., or at Triv Simpson, uh, if you want to get in touch with me personally. Uh, and yeah, that, that's where you find it all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>